Sean, it's Wednesday afternoon. We're sitting here doing a podcast, and I got to tell you, I'm still trying to process what happened in the National Hockey League Tuesday night, how it all went down, and how the Washington Capitals are in the playoffs, and the Florida Panthers are the top seed in the Atlantic Division. It was crazy. It, it was, you know, it reminded me a little bit of like the first day of uh, the NCAA basketball tournament, right? March Madness. Like you're turning on all these games, and and they're all in the last minutes, and and you know you're waiting to see what happens. You know, I, I at home I had the 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 Red Wings game on, the Capitals game on. Um, you know, flipping back and forth the the, the Florida Toronto game because that was going to determine playoff seating. You know, all of them going on NHL Network to kind of keep up with all of it, and the Capitals somehow win and, and advance. And, and that game, one of the craziest games I've ever seen. Yeah, like just for what happened in that game, the the goal that was taken away early on, which was just bonkers, and, and then. The Philadelphia Flyers pulling their goalie in a tie game, which they had to do, and it ended up being how they lost TJ Oshie into an empty net. Um, but they needed the the Flyers needed to win in regulation, and and you wondered when that pull was going to come. And as soon as it did, they paid for it. Yeah, you know, and I thought about that going into the game. I'm like, the Flyers might be in a position here where they're going to have to pull their goaltender because they can't get this. This game can't go to overtime. Right. I mean, they might be in a position where they have to pull their goalie and that would be the greatest thing that happens to the Washington Capitals. And that's exactly what happened. And, and it's the unfortunate part about it is, you know, didn't really have to do it because at around the same time or maybe just before the Red Wings scored with whatever, well, you know, less than five seconds to go or something like that. And and they pushed it to overtime, which eliminated the Flyers anyway. So. Luck was on the Washington Capitals side really makes you wonder, right? I mean, like, hey, they got really lucky in that situation with those, you know, how that all played out, the sequence of events there, and John Tortorella doing the right thing for the Philadelphia Flyers, but John Tortorella not knowing what happened in the Detroit game and how that impacted his team and the Capitals benefit and get lucky. It makes you wonder, like, hey, it's just, you know, a little... Is it going their way a little bit now? We're recording this on Wednesday, and all the playoff matches aren't set up yet. The East is set up. And, and, you know, you think about who got lucky last year, and it was the Florida Panthers. Right. Right. And they got in late. Uh, games had to go their way. The, the Penguins had to lose to Chicago, which everybody thought couldn't happen, and then it did. And after what the Detroit Red, Red Wings did the last two nights in their last two games— Tying each game really late in regulation and then winning in overtime. The tying goal in that game last night at the at the at, at in Montreal was one of the most dramatic things I've ever seen. David Perron yeah. scoring off that faceoff after a controversial icing, and, and you know the the outpouring of emotion. It it was playoff drama before playoff drama arrives. That that arrives on Saturday when we start the playoffs. But this was darn close. It, it was it was fantastic stuff, and it's exactly what you want late in the season. Three, you know, on the uh, you know Wednesday today is the penultimate day of the regular season. Thursday is the last day. Tuesday was you know a lot last for a lot of teams. It's what you want. You want it to come down to game eighty two, where a bunch of teams are going, and you got that high drama, and that's exactly what we got. So now let's say it. All right, the East is set, like you said. You get the Washington Capitals and the New York Rangers. We're going to have Tom Galitti, our colleague from NHL.com, based in Washington, D.C., joining us here in a few minutes to talk Caps Rangers, but really also go around the league. He and I are going to be covering that Caps Rangers series together. They've had some dramatic series in the past. They haven't played since 2015, but 2012, 2013, and 2015 all went to Game 7, and the Rangers won them all, so... I don't know that this one gets to Game 7. The Rangers are heavily favored in this series, but you never know, and based on the fortunate things we were talking about, too. And you got the Panthers and the Lightning. And and let's, to, let's take a look here, Sean, at the Florida Panthers for a second. We're going to touch on them as well with Tom when we talk to him. But, you know, the Panthers looked unbeatable, right, for a while. Then they hit a struggle where the bodies were going down, they couldn't seem to find their game, but now they have it back. 
and they've won, I think, four games in a row. They thoroughly kicked the you-know-what out of the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, Tuesday night when it was hands down. When they started, when they needed to do it, they did. I look at the Florida Panthers, and I say to myself, if they're at the top of their game, I don't know that – I don't think that anybody in the East can beat them if they're playing at the top of their game. Well, I, I agree with that. For a long time, I had Florida at number one in our Super 16. Um, you know, they're just a big, heavy team, and, and they play playoff hockey, and they showed it last year and getting all the way to the Stanley Cup final after being the last team to get in. You know, they're comfortable in one-goal games. They're comfortable in overtime games. They're they're fundamentally sound in the defensive end. You know, these are all things that are so important when it comes to playoffs, and they have the experience. And I think after a while in that game last night – the Toronto Maple Leafs were like, you know what? Go ahead. Yeah, we don't we don't want to play you. And they drew the Boston the Boston Bruins instead, which I I don't know how much of a better matchup that is. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. You think it's a better matchup than I do, but um, it's got to be better than playing the Florida Panthers. Here's the thing, though, that and it concerns me about the Panthers. It concerns me about the Hurricanes. Yet it doesn't, I mean, if we look at the top, the favorites right here, but it doesn't concern me about the Rangers. The The style that the that the, the Panthers play, it's hard, right? I mean, they ran out of steam last season against the Vegas Golden Knights, right? It's it's hard to play that way, and they, they throw their body all around. Guys are, you know, they get to the conference final, and you know guys are going to be pretty beat up already, right? Same with the Carolina Hurricanes. The New York Rangers don't play that style. They, they can... You know, they'll be bruised and beaten a little bit if they can get through two rounds and get to the conference final. But I almost look at it. We'll see where we're looking way ahead here, but we'll see and we'll see where it goes. But if like I said, the Panthers, if they're at the top of their game, I don't think anybody beats them. The great equalizer will be how they get there if they continue on in the playoffs. Right. And it, it because the style that they play, while conducive to playoff hockey, is also conducive to a lot of bumps and bruises and soreness and banging and injury potential too. Their injury list after the end of the Stanley Cup final was one of the most gruesome things right. I've ever seen a coach go through. Yeah. Like Paul Maurice went through it and you were just like, holy, oh my God. Like what just happened? Right? You think about it, Montour and Ekblad didn't come back. Yep. To start the year. They were nowhere to be found. They were still recovering. To Chuck, you know, that's a freak injury. But it still happened. Like, But I, I think some of that's luck. You're right. Some of that's bad luck. Um, and they're deep. Like, I think they can afford some of that. Clearly not to their key guys. And they basically had every key guy hurt by the time they ran into... Uh, a complete wagon in in the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, so I, I, I'm not worried about that. You have to play the way you play. And, and for me, the thing that differentiates both those teams from the New York Rangers is they can play in any situation you want to play, right? The, the playoffs tend to be more five-on-five. Five. Both those teams are comfortable playing five-on-five. Five. They both have really good power plays and really good penalty kills. Not the New York Rangers. That's not a good five-on-five five team. And if they're asked to play five-on-five five for three rounds of the playoffs, I think they're in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, listen, I mean, that is a, that is an interesting point, and it, and it is one thing that the Rangers don't have going their way. They've got a lot going their way. I mean, they're, they're top five in power play. They're top five in penalty kill. Their goaltending is exceptional. Their depth is really strong. I love their center depth. They have Artemi Panarin at the top of his game. He's got to be really good for them. They have motivation after the way they went out last season. They compete. They compete really hard, and that's how they've done it all year. But five on five, it's been a struggle for them at times. They don't score a ton five on five. They can give, they're can prone at times to giving up on you know rush chances. So, yeah, for a long haul, I do think that's going to be a con- – I do think that is a concern for the Rangers. I don't think it's a concern against the Washington Capitals. I, I, I just don't think it's a concern for them. The Capitals, great story to get in. Uh, I don't want to say it's going to be the old Daryl Sutter, what's the point, they're going to be out in eight days. I don't see that because the thin- the margins are very thin in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's just to me that every the, the Rangers fall on the positive on just about every side of the margin. 
Yeah, but I really like Charlie Lindgren. He's a great story. And I I love his story. And the fact that he's going to be playing his brother, um, you know, makes it even better. Um, what a great thing for the family, although I'm sure it's going to be really hard on them. Um, but he's been a fantastic story. And it's not just a story. He's been really, really good. He's the MVP of their team, hands down. Um, you know, and, and he he's the reason that they're there. Um, and you always worry about a hot, hot goaltender in the playoffs and what they can do to another team, a much a favored team. Um, so I think that's the hope. And, and let's just, you know, let's just give a little pat on the back to the coach in Washington, right? He's a, the, the Rangers have the old Washington coach in Peter Laviolette, and he gets all all the accolades and, and the hosannas and everything else for what he's done this year. President's Trophy, 55 wins, franchise record, identity, all that. Carberry's done a really good job in Washington with a team that gave up. Management gave up on him. Yeah. Sent people away at the trade deadline, said this isn't our year, you know, and, and he made a bold choice and went with a different goaltender than everybody thought they were going to go with and, and, you know, got the best out of some players that probably didn't belong there and, and you know, turned some really ugly games from becoming too big a slump and they found their way into the playoffs. I think he's done an admirable job. Yeah, look, they traded Anthony Mantha to the Vegas Golden Knights. Anthony Mantha is the Capitals' leading scorer in the four-game season series against the Rangers with three goals. They traded Evgeny Kuznetsov to the Hurricanes. They traded Joel Edmondson uh, to Toronto. So, listen, they, they sold at the deadline. They found their way in with a minus 36 goal differential. They did get there, though. We talked about it uh, with our pal Tom Galitti. Uh, who covers the Capitals for us for NHL.com, based out in Washington. I'll be covering the first round with him, Rangers Caps. Here's our interview with Tom. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. And look at you. You get to cover some home playoff games this season. Who'd have thunk it, Tom? Yeah, that's crazy. Like, even like a few weeks ago, it didn't look like the Capitals were going to get in. And and now you and I will be on the big uh, Capitals Rangers series. It should be a fun one. I haven't had one, what, since 2015? And... Those were always fun. I guess the Rangers won most of them, but they were always fun. <laughs> I don't know how they did it. Minus 36, I think it was, in goal differential. They were minus in every period in goal differential. But I think the key stat, and tell me if you agree with this, is how they play in one-goal games. If they keep it a tight game, they have a chance in this series. If, you know, listen, I mean, if it, if it – Obviously, if the Rangers jump out to early leads, it's going to be a problem for them. But if they can keep it low event and low scoring, I think that's their only chance. But at least it gives them a chance. I agree. That's basically the way they play. And and you know when they have to chase games, they fall behind by a couple of goals and open up. Then then it plays against their strengths because they're not one of the, they're not one of the fastest teams, especially when they play really fast teams that goes against them. So they have to keep the game, like you said, low event. Keep it tight, and they're and they're used to playing tight games that you play in the playoffs, and they've done pretty well at it. Like uh, I think it was uh, twenty one one goal wins, and they only lost two of those game two one goal games in, in regulation. So it's really they've been really good at winning games when they're tight. They their 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 goal differential is a product of they lost. I can't remember what it is like twenty three three goal games or plus so like, twenty four yeah twelve yeah twenty four and three goals. So games. like a lot of games got those games got away from, them and it was just like you know once once it got to a certain point. It, to them, I guess it didn't matter if you want, lost by two or two or three. They're trying to come back, and 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 that's why that that goal differential looks scary. So let me ask the expert before we move on to other parts of the playoffs: Can they keep it close? I I think it's it's going to be a challenge, but I think they can. I mean, it's you can't the the regular season and the playoffs are different, but the the regular all the four regular season games between them were, were pretty were pretty even. Uh, Capitals had one lopsided win. You know, Rangers had one win where they were up by a bunch, and then the the other two were close games. And I th I think that they can, you know, if they play the way they can, the Capitals play like we just talked about, where they keep the game tight. They they had they I think they can pull out some wins in this and make it an interesting series for sure. Before we move on, because we want to get to other series and you know other stuff going on around the league, but I did want to ask you about Charlie Lindgren, right? I mean, here's a guy they rode his coattails right to the playoffs. He was that good. 
But he started 34, I think it's 34 of their last 43 games. He was in net for those games, and he had to be great almost every single night in order to get them to this position where they're in the playoffs. Does does he have it left? Is, is there stuff left in the tank here for a guy who's never had to do this before? It's, it's a good question. We've actually, you know, even watching them recently been asking whether he had enough left just to, to get them to the finish line, and he did. He just played three games in four days for them. Uh, and, and, you know, they got through it. So it's a good question whether he can hold up, you know, it's, it'd be for his first time playing in the playoffs as well. So can he hold up over a long, he's going to be the guy, like if they're going to win, he has to be the guy that the number one guy that gets them, gets it done for them. If without him, they wouldn't be here. I mean, you can talk about players who, you know, the result talk about Sidney Crosby, you almost dragging the, 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 the Penguins into the playoffs. And, you know, I would say that their the Capitals roster was probably not as good as the Penguins roster. And Charlie Lindgren dragged the dragged the Capitals into the playoffs, basically. Him and maybe John Carlson. So so Charlie, you know, Charlie's gonna have to be the guy to drag them through the series if they're gonna win it. I was gonna scold you. You saved yourself at the last second, Tom, by mentioning John Carlson. He might be the most underrated player in the NHL today. I mean, he just played 29 minutes plus on back-to-back nights. I think he played 29 minutes plus in five of their last, four of their last five games or something like that. They've been missing Nick Jensen and, and Razza Sundin, who are second and third in ice time. And so what did they do? They just basically gave all their ice time to, to John. To John. <laughs> Not quite, but the, he he really, you know, play, he played t- 10 and a half minutes in the third period against uh, against Philadelphia. He played 11 and a half minutes in the game against Detroit last week in the third period. He played the last like four and a half minutes of the game. So they're stoppages, but it's just kind of crazy. And it's, and you know, they use them in every situation. So he's going to have to be an important player for them in this series as well against the Rangers. Yes. All right. So we, we agree that it would be a major, major upset if the Capitals can pull it off against the Rangers. There's a thin margin. They can do it, but it would be a major upset. Let's look at the other three series that are set in the Eastern Conference. You got the Panthers against the Lightning. So the Lightning, technically the underdog as the lower seed, Bruins against the Leafs, the Leafs, technically the underdog. And the Carolina Hurricanes against the Islanders, and the Islanders are technically the underdog. Lightning, Leafs, Islanders. Of those three teams, Tom, who do you think has the best chance to pull off what we would say would be an upset? Ooh, that's a that's a tough question. Like, because I mean, the teams that they're playing, like Carolina can win the Stanley Cup, Florida can win the Stanley Cup, you know, yeah. Boston can win the Stanley. Like any of those teams can win the Stanley Cup, and one of them probably, will, maybe one of them will lose, maybe more than one. I'm going to say that Tampa Bay has the best chance, although I really like Florida's team. They're just because they have that pedigree. I think last year they were pretty much on fumes by the time they got to the playoffs after three consecutive cup runs with a bunch of games in there. And I think they refreshed. And I think they also strengthened their depth with some of the moves they made over the, over the season. So uh, if I had to pick one of the teams, I would, I'm going to say Tampa Bay. And they have Vasilevsky, who is the great equalizer in whatever the talent disparity might be. I think they're the only ones. So I'm going to be even bolder than you, Tom. I think they're the only ones that have a chance at an upset. I, I think that the New York Islanders are completely out of their depth um, when you look at how good this Carolina team is and what they're good at, right? They're they're phenomenal penalty killers. The Islanders already can't score on the power play. They're good on the power play. The Islanders can't defend the power play. Um, you know, they're good late in games. The Islanders have been terrible late in games. Uh, I just... I don't see a way out for that Islander team. And then the Leafs just drew a bad matchup again, I think. Unless you're looking at what Boston did late in the series and maybe have a little bit of a raised eyebrow because they, 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 they were in a position to win that. They almost could have won the President's Trophy and they dropped out. of They went from that to, to dropping in, into the second seed. I don't know how much they cared in the last couple of weeks of the season, but the, they didn't look when they played the Capitals on Monday. I didn't think they looked like they had a much of a care factor in that game other than maybe Pasternak was trying to score, but like, so they're going to have to, they're going to have to flip the switch again. And, you know, we know what they did last year. The, the playoffs was a big disappointment. So maybe they're saving themselves for the playoffs when they, from when the, from when they start, uh, next, you know, this weekend. See, here's the thing. I think the Boston Bruins wanted the Toronto Maple Leafs. I don't think they played to get the Toronto Maple Leafs, but I think they wanted the Toronto Maple Leafs. Flip it. The Toronto Maple Leafs want the Boston Bruins. They wanted no part of the Florida Panthers. And I argued this with our colleague, Emily Benjamin. We're doing state your cases on NHL.com for all the series that we have. And I argued for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I think that the Toronto Maple Leafs can pull this upset. And I understand the history and I understand the defensive issues, if you will. And I also understand the goaltending that, that Boston has. 
But I look at it and I say, Toronto has center depth. Right now, the Boston Bruins do not. They don't have guys who can be game changers down the middle. The Toronto Maple Leafs do, and I think that's a great equalizer in this series. And the other thing when you look at the Boston Bruins and the Toronto Maple Leafs is, yes, Jeremy Swayman is great, and Linus Elmark is great. Only one of them can play. And the, uh, and the guy who's playing might have the corner of his eye looking over his shoulder because a bad goal means the other guy could go in. When was the last time a team that had a goalie rotation did well? in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It doesn't work. You pick a guy and you go with him, and maybe that's what Boston does, but I still think with that uncertainty for each guy, I do wonder if that plays a role, and if it does, it plays to the benefit of the Maple Leafs. And Ilya Samsonov, for all of his warts throughout the whole season, 18-4-2 since January 21st. Yeah, you believe in Samsonov in the playoffs? I believe that the Toronto Maple Leafs will be able to score in this series. Uh, and I, I the, the Boston Bruins have great goaltending. They do. But you know what? They're not as good defensively as they once were. They're certainly not as good down the middle as they once were. They're not as dangerous offensively as they once were. So I think, the, I think you know, Matthews, Marner, Tavares, Nylander, it's, I, I think they're going to be able to find ways to score in this series, score enough. And, I, and I'm going to say, yes, I think Samsonov is a guy that I'm going to believe in to win this series. I think with that series, it's going to be really interesting because I think there's going to be, you know, Eddie Olchek was just saying this in a, in a promo for TNA, TNT. There's going to be a, probably some fallout for the team that loses that that game. There's going to be changes for the team that loses that series, you know. I think it's going to be a really good series. I, th I think either team can win, actually. I, I have a question mark about Samsonov. I watched him here in – in Washington for a couple of years in playoffs. And last year he did not play well in the playoffs. They won a series kind of in spite of him because Vasilevsky really didn't have a good series in that last year. Um, and he's kind of faltered down the stretch here again, as, as, as well as he played for a couple of months. So the games, it'll be interesting. I, I think you're going to see both go. I think you're going to see both Toronto goalies. You're going to see both Boston goalies. And another situation you mentioned with rotating, that's what Carolina is going to do. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. They could end up playing three goalies for all I know, I, I'm not, <laughs> the, the way they are. But it doesn't really seem to matter that much with them who plays in that the way they play. The thing that scares me about the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it's happened all along, is they have a really good game, and then they just throw in a stinker. And if you watch the game last night, the Florida Panthers came out like they were sound asleep. They had no interest in playing that game. Toronto went up 2 nothing. All of a sudden, Florida decided they wanted to play. 29 shots on net in the second period. That's more shots than set eight teams this year averaged per game. You don't have a defense when you're letting up 29 shots in a period. That's 29 shots in 20 minutes. That's a shot and a half every minute. I don't care if you have Martin Brodeur as your goalie. You're dead. That's a one-off, one period. I don't know that it's that not a one-off. They do it all the time. That period's a one-off, uh, and I think the, this is a reason why I don't think the Lightning stand much of a chance against the Florida Panthers. To be honest with you, that exact reason when the the Florida Panthers turn it on, with due respect to the Rangers, fifty-five wins and one hundred and fourteen points. Due respect to the Carolina Hurricanes, when the Florida Panthers turn it on, they're the best team in the Eastern Conference, and they may be the best team in the National Hockey League. They're heavy. They're fast, they score, they defend well, and they have excellent goaltending. They have every ingredient. That's why I don't think – the Lightning don't. So I don't think that they stand a chance to go against what Tom was saying. I don't think that they stand much of a chance in that series. And with Toronto and Boston, again, I, I go back to it. I just think the Leafs' high-end talent will get it done. For this round, I think I, I don't believe I have been a skeptic of the Boston Bruins all year. I think it's remarkable that they were able to do what they did. But look, the way they finished is alarming to me. It is. They had something to play for and they didn't. Maybe they were playing for Toronto. I don't know. Uh, and I just, you know, Charlie Coyle and Pavel Zaka. It's not Patrice Bergeron. Patrice Bergeron was the great equalizer. Every time the Bruins and Leafs would play, it was Bergeron, right? Well, he's not there anymore. And now there's a little bit of areas to expose, I think, for Toronto. So, Tom, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of – that's where I'm at. I think we – I agree with you guys on Carolina, uh, the Carolina Islander series, or at least I agree with Sean. I don't know where you're at with that, Tom. 
Um, I think, you know, last year that series was closer than I think it might have looked at. Like, I think the, you know, they won in six Carolina and, and game six was an overtime. So they were, they were, they were a goal away, you know, a bad bank goal away from getting to maybe game seven and, and you never know. But I think Carolina is a stronger team than they were last year with Eddie Jane, Jake Gensel. Um, they, they have what they were missing last year. Uh, I don't know what Kuznetsov will give them after he hasn't been that productive after their initial start, but I, I feel like he, he probably has a moment coming for them in the playoffs, but they have so much forward depth that they didn't have last year. I think it's going to be a difference in that series. Like I said, I don't even think that series is, is going to be competitive and I hope it is. I, I know I'm doing at least part of that series and I'm looking forward to, you know, going down to Raleigh and, and, and experiencing that again. But I, I just look at that team and, and all the disappointments they've had and how they've hardened themselves over that. And then, management finally went out after all those years of not doing anything at the deadline and did something and Gensel 25 points in 17 games since he's been a hurricane like that is a huge huge difference and then their d their d is the great equalizer like they can match up against anybody and and, and we don't know if the islanders are going to have no adoption and if they don't oh boy yeah that one i i do have a feeling that that could be a quick series that you know, and also you have to wonder too about is it Varlamov, is it Sorokin? So there, there's stuff there. Tom, before we let you go though, I want to let's go to the West. The Colorado Avalanche have struggled, right? They've lost five games in a row. They're allowing goals left and right. Uh, we know McKinnon's great, Rantanen, you know everybody there, Makar, but I don't know. Like I, I, I think what we've seen from them here down the stretch late in the season is a little bit of an indication of what we thought we might see coming midway through the season, right? When Alexander Georgiev's games were piling up, the question started to become, you know, I mean, is it too much? Is it too much? They didn't go out and address the goaltending, you know, at the deadline to to get that help. Is it too much? And I think it might be too much. I look at them and, you know, they won the Stanley Cup two years ago with, I would say, like, decent goaltending, average goal, not great goaltending with Darcy Kemper and, and so I think they're just, they just need to get average goaltending, but can they, does, does, does Yorgiev have that left in him? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. The way they've, they, the way they've kind of spiraled here at the end of the season. And now they're going to, you know, be, be, you know, playing the Jets who are seem to be getting their game back right at the right time. And it'd be interesting to see that series, I think is going to be a fun series to watch to see, you know, the Jets last year, they went in kind of limping in and it didn't go so well. I mean, they lost the eventual champions, but we know, we know there was changes that came after that. And I think they have a really good team, the the, the Jets. So that's going to be t- that's going to be a challenge right off the bat for, for Colorado. They're not just you know they're not getting an easy series off the bat to start with and get their feet wet. That's for sure. Look, I've waved the Colorado Avalanche pom poms from day one, number one in the Super Sixteen. Nathan McKinnon as the MVP, all of it. I I I think so highly of this team. They drew the worst possible matchup they could draw. The Jets give them fits. They forget the seven to nothing game the other day. Like you just write that off as a bad goaltender. But the games before that were similar. Like it's just the Jets are one of those teams that's really deep. They know how to play against Nathan McKinnon. And if you can figure out how to neutralize that line, you got a really good chance of winning. And then on the other end, you have a goalie that can even make skill guys like McKinnon, Ranton, and McCarr shake their heads and say, when are we going to solve this cat? And all of a sudden, it's over, and they haven't done it yet. So I want to still believe in the Colorado Avalanche. The Winnipeg Jets scare the snot out of me. So, and that's an interesting, and it leads to the same question. I'm going to, Tom, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked about the East. Let's assume, let's just, for the case of this, is we're recording this on Wednesday. Let's assume it's Edmonton and Vegas. And it is Dallas and Los Angeles, right? Vegas has to get a win. They need to beat the Anaheim Ducks. They do that. They get third. They play Edmonton. We know it's going to be Vancouver and Nashville. We know it's going to be Winnipeg and Aval- and and the Colorado Avalanche. So Nashville, Colorado, Vegas, and LA would be technically the underdogs in those series. Is the answer so obvious that the best underdog is the Vegas Golden Knights and the best chance to win, or do you see something else? Yeah, I think I I just I never count out the defending Stanley Cup champions, and they actually you know they're gonna get if you know they get Mark Stone back, and they added Thomas Hurdle, and they added Anthony Manton, they added you know uh, Hayden Fleury. I mean, <laughs> they I mean they they they've just they just um, they've just been uh, 
you know, I, 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 I would be scared of them if I were Edmonton. Edmonton has a really good team. <laughs> like I, I don't want to discount what Edmonton has and, and they're, they've been a team on a mission, you know, since the coaching change. So, but I, I, I would say that, yes, the Vegas is Vegas is a team that, um, that has the best chance in the West of, of, of pulling off an upset. If you put that in quotes. <laughs> Look, I covered that series for at least part of it last year. And at times it seemed like the Golden Knights were almost toying with the Oilers, right? Because and you forgot to mention Noah Hannafin, so deep on the on the back line, a good defensive center. They can match up with two lines, right? If you can match up with two lines against Edmonton and you're gonna win the bottom six, that's how you're gonna beat them. And Vegas to me wins that bottom six all day and twice on Sunday. You see, I, I'm going to do the same thing I did with Toronto. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Edmonton in this series, and I'm I, maybe I'm just being contrarian this year because typically I would pick against Toronto in the first round and against Edmonton if they're playing Vegas. But I'm going to go Edmonton, and I think the team that has the best chance to pull the upset in this one, and Sean's going to love this because we do this every week. We praise the Nashville Predators and Nashville Predators because he's been waving those pom-poms for longer and he's been waving the avalanche. I think Nashville's got the got a great chance here to pull an upset on the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, Tom, last thought, what do you think? Well, I, I do think, you know, Vancouver, I thought, has impressed me actually in the last couple of weeks or so because I thought they were fading and they've kind of picked it up here and getting Thatcher Demko back, uh, I think it's going to make a big difference in that series. Uh, you know, Saros is going to have to be really, really, really play really well for, for Nashville though in that series. I think Nashville does have a chance because I don't know if, if Vancouver is the team we saw in the first half of the season who was really dominating and looked like they were, you know, they were going to win the cup, you know, I, I do think Nashville has a chance because, but I, I'm not sure that Nashville is playing in the same level they were playing at two weeks, you know, two, three weeks ago either. So it's going to be, I, I, I'm going to pick Vancouver in that series, but I think, it, I think that, that uh, Nashville really has a, has a good chance with the, with the team they have. And they have some experienced guys too, that they brought in that, that, that could help them win. It's really going to depend on Thatcher Demko. Like how healthy is he? You know, he's had the one game back. Goalies are tricky, right? Like he, he, it takes you a while to get back into the swing of things and he doesn't have that luxury, but if he can come back and, and pick right up where he left off, we were talking about him in the Vezina conversation when he got hurt and he left a little over a month ago. If he's that goalie, then Vegas, I then, then Vancouver has a really good chance. If he's not that goalie, then yeah, Nashville's the upset special. Great goalie series. That's going to be a great goalie series. I just want to throw something in on Dallas and they're to me, they look like the favorite in the West right now. They have the, they have so much depth and, you know, they have a, you know, if Bottinger's back to playing the way he can play that they're going to be tough to beat. Also, if you look at, you know, everyone seems, Oh, you got to tank to get really good young talent. Well, go look at what, what, how Dallas built their team. They didn't have to tank. They have fantastic young players. Wine Johnson say, you know, they just, they're, they're just, you know, Robertson, they're, they're, they're deep. They're experienced and young mixed together. Like I have, They've had one of the best mixes in the league, I think. Well, they're my pick to win the Stanley Cup. We didn't even talk about them until you just brought them up, but they're my pick to win the Stanley Cup. Tom, thanks for joining us. I'll see you in a few days. Yes, looking forward to it. Should be fun. Good stuff there with Tom. And, Sean, let's continue. We were, we were talking about the West. I, I like that he brought up Dallas. Dallas is my favorite to win the Stanley Cup. I agree with Tom in saying that they're the example of a team that didn't need to tank in order to build, right? I mean, they look at the way their team is built. They are still built through a number of draft picks, veteran guys who have been there before, a couple of good trades. Uh, they're, they're a dangerous, very, very dangerous team. And if they draw the Kings in the first round, I think that will be a situation where it's eight days and the Los Angeles Kings are out. I don't know. I think the Kings can ten, give teams, ten days, ten days. They can give <laughs> they can give teams fits. Look, if Kopitar's not healthy and he's been struggling down the stretch to play games, that that changes the whole dynamic. But you're right. The stars, you know, and Tom mentioned a couple of young players, and, and he mentioned Robertson, and he mentioned, um, you know, uh, a, a couple of players like that. But he forgot the guys that have come in this year in, in Stankoven and, and, and Harley and, and have added even more depth, right? They're a three-line scoring team now. And there's very few of those teams in the NHL. And again, you know, a lot of times in the playoffs, we talk about neutralizing the top six and believing when you're a championship team that you can win the bottom six very easily or, or by a decisive margin. 
And I, I, I believe that's what the Dallas Stars believe, that they can go toe-to-toe with anybody's top six and then they can change a whole series with their bottom six. Yeah. I mean, when we had Razor on, right, that's what he was talking about too, and he was talking about their defense, Daryl Ray, right? He was talking about their defense. We talked about Jake Ottinger. Um, there's a lot to like there in Dallas. I, I don't think that, you know, listen, I mean, if it ends up being Dallas – against the Vegas Golden Knights. It's going to be a great series, but I still think, I mean, it's Wednesday as we're recording this. We don't know yet, right? Vegas has to beat the Anaheim Ducks. If they beat the Anaheim Ducks, which they should do, if they win against Anaheim, they'll get third. They'll play Edmonton. L.A., who plays Chicago in their last game, will then drop and, well, we'll we'll stay where they are uh, and will be the second wild card and face the Dallas Stars. So we like Dallas. I, I talked to you before. Edmonton to me is a team that they've got experience now they kind of have an under they have they should have an understanding and if they end up playing vegas they also have an understanding of what they're getting into as well i don't have a specific reason sean i cannot give you a specific 100 percent reason i just have a feel for the edmonton oilers since they made the coaching change they're a different team They look like a team that's ready to play better defensively, has played better defensively, understands the need to protect the front of the net. They may stray at times. They're not perfect, right? Um, But they protect the front of their net much better than they have in the past, certainly much better than they did last, last season. I think they'll find a way. I do. I think they're a very dangerous team that if gets going could be one of those teams that goes on a magical run. I like Dallas still in the West, but the way, uh, like Skinner, he's good. He doesn't have the pedigree. He's not the guy everybody's looking at and saying he's got, he's the difference maker. But if he is, nobody was looking at Aiden Hill like that either, right? But if he is, look out for the Edmonton Oilers. So you have, what, four teams in the West? That no, I like Dallas. Look out for? I like Dallas. Dallas is my team. But I'm saying I would not – a lot of people, if it's Vegas, are going to pick the Vegas Golden Knights to win that series because they're the defending Stanley Cup champions and all that and everybody that they added. I also think it's a lot of additions, and it's hard to find all that chemistry together. They're bringing in guys late. Hurdle came in late. We don't. Mark Stone, it, I don't know if he'll be back, right? We don't know about that. He's the heart and soul of that team. Uh, he was a huge piece of – for their puzzle last season. It's different. It's a different year. Everybody's going to look at the Vegas Golden Knights and be like, well, they're, they're the team. Every Look at the Vegas Golden Knights. It's a different year, and they've struggled this season. They have. Dan, you don't know that Mark Stone's 100% healthy and he's going to be raring to go <laughs> uh, for game one of the playoffs whenever they play it. This, is all been a, this has all been a ruse for over a month. Conspiracy theories? Is that where we're going with now? Yeah, no, that's that's what the internet tells me that uh, you know this is this is don't all find been any pl- conspiracy theories there. <laughs> this has all been planned forever. Which, in case anybody doesn't realize, that my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek. Mark Stone was hurt. The Vegas Golden Knights played by the rules, and nobody knows what Mark Stone's going to be like when and if he comes back. Um, and it is going to be difficult. Uh, I, look, the Edmonton Oilers are, are going to confound people forever, I think, just because of the amount of talent that they have. I think they are a little bit of a different team. I think they have the same fatal DNA flaws that they've always had. Um, you, 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 There's nothing after their first two lines. Um, I don't know that I believe in Skinner. He's had a really good regular season. I like their defense a little more than I did last year. I think they've grown. Knobloch's never coached in, in a playoff game. And think about some of the guys that he's going to have to go against in a long run. Cassidy, DeBoer, Bones, Bednar, Stanley Cup champion. Like, these are some of the brightest minds in the game. Nothing wrong about what you just said. But I got a feel for the Edmonton Oilers. So, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. I think we both... Are you in agreement here on the Winnipeg Jets to beat the Colorado Avalanche? You said it's the worst possible matchup 
that the Avalanche could have. And, and you've been on the Avalanche bandwagon, and rightly so. They've been a very good team for the majority of this season. But are you now thinking it's a one and done for the Avalanche? I'm not there yet. But I think this is a seven-game double overtime series. Okay. Um, but it is so close, and the margins are so thin. I, I, I just and look, they've they've completely put a blanket over Nathan McKinnon in the times that they played. I don't know of anybody that's going to do that for seven games. Like Nathan's going to have his say at some point. Uh, it's really going to come down to the goaltending, and it is so lopsided in, in Winnipeg's favor that I, I, I it's really hard to make up that difference just because of the, five. just because of the emotional and psychological warfare that it becomes bad goals and not being mm-hmm. able to score on great chances and they add up and they become cumulative and all of a sudden you're completely lost and it's over yeah hey best five on five team in the national hockey league the winnipeg jets or at least in the western conference florida's right there as well and Winnipeg and doesn't take penalties. No. Their PK is not that great, but they're not on it that much. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm going with Winnipeg in that series. All right, so the playoffs start Saturday. Uh, family of networks, ESPN, Turner, obviously all the coverage we're going to have on NHL.com. I would suggest you go there first and then go everywhere else. Um, but that's just me. Uh, so playoffs start Saturday, but there's a lot of other things going on, Sean, and we got news this week. Uh, it reminds you that the off season has hit for some teams as well, or is close to hitting for some teams as well. Don Granado out as the Buffalo Sabres coach and round and round they go in Buffalo. Another coaching change. Where does it stop? I have no idea. Sean, were you surprised Don Granado got fired? No. No, and and only because he pretty much signed his own death certificate, right? We weren't ready. We couldn't handle the expectations. All, all the things that were said late in that season, like I, I, I think, you know, there was an acknowledgement that they didn't perform up to yeah. expectations, right? And, and some of that falls on the coach, and the pressure is mounting year by year, um, in Buffalo, there was so, the expectations were so high this year. Like, and when I say high, I just mean the playoffs. Like, if they had gotten in the playoffs and went out in the first round, I think that would have been okay. It would have showed a step forward, but they were stagnant. And to me, stagnation is regression. They do the same thing, regardless of the coach. They're doing the same thing every year. They do it. When but it this gets was hard, different. they were better. I know, but when it gets hard. They fade when it becomes, for lack of a better term, garbage time and everybody thinks they're out. Oh, here come the Buffalo Sabres, right? At some point, that DNA has got to change. You you can't have these lulls. You can't have these moments where like, ooh, we're on the cusp. We're playing better. Uh, games are getting harder now, right? It's March and here we go. And and then you fail. You'll just fall apart. It's, it's, it's got to stop. I don't know how it does. Um, I'm not surprised with Don Granato. I, you know, it, he's... No, I think he came in known as more of a development guy, right? And he's gotten a lot out of them. I think he's got a, a future. I think he'll coach again in the National Hockey League. You think about it, though. Remember, go back to the player media tour, right? In, in September, there were comments about how they love him, right? They love Granado and, and everything. It makes you wonder, like, is it more of a country club atmosphere or whatever, whatever that might be, right? I don't think so. They also didn't have goaltending for the first 50 games of the season, basically, and that's an absolute killer. UPL, Uka Pekalukunen, has stepped up. Maybe he is a number one goalie. We'll find out. But it's it, To me, it's an exciting job in Buffalo. Whoever gets that job, it's an exciting job because you have a good core. You have three studs on your back, on your back end, you know, in Darlene, Power, and, and Bowen Byram. You, you have, maybe you have your goaltending figured out. You've got guys up front who can play and you know you can rely on. The core is in place. It just needs to change its DNA somehow, some way. Maybe that's a coach, but uh, this is not a job for a, like, this is not a job for a first year NHL coach anymore. This cannot be a first year NHL coach. Like David Carl's coming in, right? I mean, maybe he's going to get a job. University of Denver, national champion. You know, he's a hot name. 
That's not where I would go. I would go with like a, a Craig Berube or a Dean Evason or Todd McClellan. Somebody's going to come in and just lay their foot down and be like, guys, here is everything that you've done wrong. And here's why. And here's what we need to change. And I know how to change it because I've done it. And I will point to how I've done it. I did it here. I did it here. And I did it here. And look at the results. That's what they need. No, I don't agree. I, I look. I, yeah, I know. Uh, to <laughs> me, the best guy for the job is Seth Appert. He's the guy that knows all these guys. He's the guy that's developed them. He's the guy that's brought them success. And and, and you look at what Knobloch's doing in Edmonton. Like, was that a job for a first-year guy? They had underperformed so many times, and they had gone very much like Buffalo. They had gone in all these crazy directions, right? Oh, we need this guy. Oh, we need this guy. He he's a really forward thinker. We need this guy. He's you know, he's on the cutting edge of of all these training and other things. And we need this guy. And then all of a sudden, well, we're gonna go with the guy who kind of brought up Connor McDavid. And we're going to give that a whirl. And everybody's like, oh, what are you doing? You're coaching a Hartford Wolfpack coach. This is craziness. This is a Stanley Cup team. You're, you're giving up, blah, blah, blah. And now where are they? They're so good that you're in love with them to be the Cinderella story in the Stanley Cup finals. What's the difference between him and Seth Eppert? Difference is, is that he came from a different organization, number one. Uh, yes, he came from the American Hockey League, and it is his first National Hockey League job. It was in season. Uh, it was a bump in season, and it just and they wrote it. They have the arguably the best player in the world on their team, and maybe you know they have another guy who's a top five player in the world on their team. So that kind of helps as well. So there was Knobloch a playoff did pedigree. Nothing. What's that? No, no, no. So Knobloch, Knobloch did a did good nothing. job. I'm not saying that he didn't do a good job. He put it back together. He got him playing defense. Uh, he he definitely has tightened up there. But there was a pedigree there. There was a playoff team there, and they were underperforming. The Buffalo. Are, are we going to continue to say that the Buffalo? What is the Buffalo Sabres? Yeah. Well, isn't why? That why the coach? Perf- isn't that why the coach just got fired? Yeah, but underperforming from what? They haven't made the playoffs since 2011. What are we modeling this against? What are we measuring this against? They're doing the same thing every single season. They missed the playoffs by one point last year. They missed the playoffs again this year. What is the what is the measuring stick for the Buffalo Sabres? At least the Edmonton Oilers knew what they were capable of doing. And they went and hired an AHL coach to do it with no experience. Out of all the guys you also, named, in, and then we're going to drop this, out of all the guys you named to be the coach in Buffalo, how many of them are in the playoffs? Well, Craig Berube just won the Stanley Cup a couple of years ago, and Dean Evason has been to the playoffs with the Minnesota Wild. Todd McClellan, been to the playoffs with the Los Angeles Kings. The only of the, they were all fired this year. The only team that made the playoffs of the three were the LA Kings, who when they were firing Todd McClellan were a playoff team. They didn't get much better without him. Certainly St. Louis didn't do much better without Barubi, and the Minnesota Wild didn't do better without Dean Everson. So I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think it was the coaching. Okay. Next topic. Right? All right. Next topic. That does lead to a different conversation, though, because some other teams out there. So Buffalo needs a coach. What happens in New Jersey? I don't know that the Travis Green experiment went exactly as planned. What happens in Ottawa? I mean, Jacques Martin's not going to get that job. hes I don't think he wants the job. He doesn't want it. Yeah, he doesn't want the job. Those are two jobs right there. I think the Buffalo job is an exciting job because you have a lot of pieces in place and you can be the coach that finally gets this team back into the playoffs and gets them going in the right direction. But New Jersey and Ottawa are very exciting jobs as well. Like, I think some of these openings that are going to be there, this, this, uh, that are, you know, if, if New Jersey is an opening, it's going to be enticing for some of these coaches out there. And, you know, it's, I don't think it, it, everybody's going to, who wants a job is going to get one, but it's going to, these are some exciting jobs because you got some exciting players on these teams. And Ottawa under, Ottawa underperformed this year based on what their expectations were. The New Jersey Devils 100% underperformed this year based on what they did last season. I think a lot of that had to do with goaltending and injuries, especially the injury to Dougie Hamilton. But exciting jobs that, you know, could be coach of the year candidates a year from now. Yeah, I could see, and they wouldn't be exactly the same. I was going to say I could see the New Jersey Devils being the the Philadelphia Flyers of this year, but they wouldn't because the Flyers were bad for so long and and then had an incredible year and lost out on the last day of the season. But look, they're going to have a better goalie. 
the 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 Devils. Like that's already been well, they should have a better goalie. There's they already should. been a, yeah. a commitment made to go get a big name goalie, and Jake Allen was good for them, you know, down the stretch, um, and, and that's a pretty good tandem. Dougie Hamilton, the Devils had their baggy day today, and Dougie Hamilton told our colleague Mike Morial that if they had made the playoffs and if they had gotten in, there was a possibility that he could have played. Um, so he's close to being back, and I don't think anybody understands what a death knell that was for the yeah. New Jersey Devils. It absolutely crushed them. And it made their goaltending look worse than it was. It's the same goalies that last year got them into the playoffs. Um, he, his absence absolutely crushed the Devils. So now you bring him back into the lineup healthy. You got a better goaltender. You got a lot of these guys that have grown up a year um, that that are younger guys. And, you know, Jack Hughes at 100%. He has to have offseason so shoulder surgery. You know, that, that's a really good team with some other Eastern Conference teams getting really old that are, that are in the vanguard. There's going to be openings. Well, it's very obvious that there's openings in the Metro. A team with a minus 36 goal differential just made the playoffs, right? I mean, and they're an older team that's not a And they're going to get older. Yeah. Yeah. So there's it's very obvious. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Ottawa's an interesting one too. So there's some there's some interesting jobs out there. That's going to dominate a little bit of the off season for these teams that are already now starting their off season or a day or two away from starting their off season as well. And I do want to throw this out there. Two more things before we get out of here. One, Mark Andre Fleury, one year contract, two and a half million, says it's going to be his last year. He's got one more year now with the Minnesota Wild. Signed that contract. Actually announced today, Wednesday. The National Hockey League is a better league when Marc-Andre Fleury is in it, and I'm very happy he's going to be returning for at least one more year. And the beauty of this, too, is he's still really good, and I think the Wild are going to be a competitive team again, yet also Marc-Andre Fleury is going to get that swan song that I think he so richly deserves. This is double swan song. He he got it a couple of times already this year, you know, yeah. going back into <laughs> Montreal and stuff like that. The, everybody in the league is happy that Marc-Andre Fleury's back. On set for Brandon Duhame. Brandon Duhame is not happy. <laughs> not happy. If people didn't see it, Mark Andre Fleury is the king of pranks, and even Brandon Duhame, who tried to out prank Mark Andre Fleury, eventually said, "If you mess with the bull, you're going to get the horns." Mark uh, Duhame TP'd Mark Andre's car when the when they played uh, each other, uh, Colorado and. And Minnesota and Duhame used to be on Minnesota. So to return the favor, Marc-Andre Fleury took off all four tires of Brandon Duhame's. I think it was a Jeep Cherokee. Then scattered a bunch of dirt on the hood and planted some flowers. He locked the tires up, too. He locked the tires up. Planted some flowers and left a note and walked away. And made sure that the social team filmed the whole thing. He turned the dude's car into a garden. Like... I'm glad he's back. I'm glad he's back. That's a really good thing. And one more thing. I'm going to put this out there because I said it earlier in the season. I said when the San Jose Sharks were really struggling and couldn't win a game, don't worry. They'll win 20. They have 19 wins and one more game to play against the Calgary Flames. They're winning 20, Sean. The San Jose Sharks are going to win 20 games this year. Dan, do I ever doubt you? (laughs) Man, I hope they win 20. I really do. I don't know why, but I do. I the, hope they the win worst 22. Team in the league this for, year. Uh, good for David Quinn if they get to 20. And, yeah. and it, it, this is always an exciting time for all of these teams. Like you think about Anaheim and we talked about how, you know, Vegas has to go in there and win a game. They get Carter Gauthier fresh off the Frozen Four. He's going to play his first game during the first year of his contract. He's going to be a huge part of their team next year. All those other players that came in from from the Frozen Four and from the end of Canadian Hockey League seasons, you know, every year you kind of get this fresh impetus of players that you see. Some who make the playoffs and make huge impacts. You know, you think back to Chris Kreider when he came into the league um, and others who you're going to have to wait a little bit, but you're going to get at least a taste of it. And it's a reason to watch that game against uh, Anaheim and Vegas where maybe you wouldn't even though there is a playoff implication to it I, I I just find this time of the year to be so enthralling and it's almost like an appetizer to get ready for the playoffs which start on Saturday and then you know hockey really meaningful hockey almost every day for two months straight yep and the next time we talk we will be in the playoffs 
Like you said, they start on Saturday, a bunch of games Saturday, Sunday. We'll get them full going. Can't wait for it to happen. The West will be settled by Thursday night. The East is already settled. Sean, this was fun. We thank Tom. Everybody, enjoy the hockey.